So what uh, did we discuss? I think we had the same type of discussion that like everybody this morning and for every tissue. I guess the, the, the main uh, first discussion is what the tissue source. Do you go for the full organs from maybe transplant or like post-mortem uh, tissue? Uh, of course, how many individuals and to address the geographical spread and ethnicity? We didn't like uh, discuss too much, but also like the stage is important, fetal, pediatric, adult, geriatric. And I, I guess we all know that the source of the tissue um, have trade-off and, you know, post-mostem is you have your, the whole organs, but there is also some thing that you cannot really control. And again, to define what is healthy in the gut um, with that is known to have like perturbation, uh, microbiome, diet, antibiotics that also were raised as a very important confounding effect, as well as like a chronic inflammation or like sub-minimal inflammation that cannot be seen maybe. Uh, with second part was on the experimental design, um, preparation, protocols, a SOP, uh, the nuclear sec versus dissociated sec, and uh, the estimation of how many cells uh, we need. And uh, basically, like Moshe did a, a quick estimation, assuming that we will do, like, uh, let's say, D sites per gut on triplicate on three patients. Uh, we came out with uh, 10 million cells for the gut, which is quite a significant amount already of the total cells for, for this uh, human cell atlas. And this is also assuming a uh, minimum fraction of 1.01%, uh, uh, 60 different cell type, and of course, uh, assuming that we want to have 50 uh, single cell per cell type. <coughs> but it's still kind of like doable. Um, following on, on, on this, um, we also highlighted the very important aspect of uh, the spatial branch, and you know, I through put imaging to, the most important thing is to correlate also with the data that we will get with nuclear seek and dissociated seek, because we all know that uh, you know protocols affect cell type uh, unequally, and we don't know really if uh, all, all cell type are equally capturable and really, really ca you know for the analysis. So for sampling, we discuss about uh, doing first maybe like a, um, a very like a simple analysis with like you know like uh, accessing like different region at the, uh, in triplicate define also like based on analytical definition. We also discuss about the need of having a pathologist involved in the process, not only to look at the slide to see if the tissue is of good quality, but also to maybe design what we call uh, you know, a, be a coordinated tissue um, to basically uh, define carefully the anatomy of the specimen. And also this goes or be shared across, uh, across labs. Uh, what are the gut-specific challenge? Um, of course, this we discussed about maybe the, the need of gut-specific protocol versus other tissue. Again, the, the, uh, you know, tar maybe to target a specific subregion. And I think also, like uh, Ron uh, alluded, maybe to the need of maybe having a first round of like low uh, low density, like histology and like um, uh, tissue imaging to maybe identify a, a tissue of interest. Also, we discuss about maybe to, to focus maybe sometime on unique regions which are relevant to tissue-specific disease that could be also of interest to really target some, some, some region that we, we will make, be able to make quick discovery. Uh, then after, like we discussed the idea of like a common denominator, not across gut lab, but also across tissue. I think it's going to be very important for all of us to, to see if we, if we see common uh, signatures of cells and uh, the quality and try to normalize. And the idea is to have maybe some, <coughs> some, some bridge samples. And I think we, we, we might, it was not clear maybe from the other presentation, but it will be maybe very important uh, not only to collect, of course, the microbiome from each of these gut samples, but also to try to get some blood sample from each donor and try to also um, single cell all of these different uh, 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 cell population composed in the blood and try and use this as like a normalizer or maybe like a common uh, a sample. And also the idea to define the minimal common knowledge across tissue uh, to, uh, to, to, to bridge across lab. And again, the discussion of like having either a coordinated experimental design or independent lab driven project. And this is not very, very clear in, the opinion, in my opinion yet. The last point of discussion, uh, we mostly discuss a bit about the organic alternative. The drawback of this is there is, uh, you know, it's not a drawback, but for us, immunologists, there is no immune cells, so it's going to be mostly focused on epithelial uh, a type of like a differentiation, which also have like a, a lot of interest. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? So I don't know if you caught it, but did you mention you will sequence the microbiome from these individuals or no? Yeah, so this is something that we 
that is, there is not a, a full decision, but I think unanimously we all saw that this will be very important, especially yeah. like across the different uh, part of the gut to basically sample at each place we collect a biopsy, either from the full gut or even doing like a biopsy sampling to really try to get this information because it's a low-hanging fruit, in fact. Exactly. It's, uh, it's yeah, I think important. it would be a mistake not to include yeah, yeah. it. So yeah, so microbiome, also like uh, uh, maybe some, uh, you know, information on diet, antibiotic treatment, and after maybe the blood also. I think blood collection, that should be maybe a standard across every, t every tissue to mm -hmm. try to see, you know, um, as a reference map. Maybe. Okay. As I understand it, the organoids don't have a stroma either. I just wonder whether you could comment on the impact of that uh, on, on the current initiative. So I'm, uh, I have to confess that I'm not a very, a very um, well expert on organoids. So I know that organoids will be mostly composed of epithelial cells. Uh, clearly, one of, I mentioned the drawback is like there is no immune cells, although you can maybe seed them with I immune cells. After, uh, we need to ask the expert, I don't know, where is the expert here? From the Hans Clever lab, who was like representing us, if you can comment. But this is also like, again, a limitation. But, um, I, I think that part about the blood is very interesting from the point of view, if you could make cell lines from every single sample, then you could go back and you could make organoids of many different types from the, for your particular donor, and then you could use that model to go back and look at the actual same cells that you started from. So I think it could be valuable in more than one way to bank that. Yeah, so cell line, or you can even think about IPSC, but this is also like another level of... Uh, but I, I, I do think that, you know, I depend, I, what I see across the different uh, uh, projects is that there's this discussion about low numbers but heavy, heavy and, and deep, uh, really, knowledge versus higher number and less access. I think maybe for a cross tissue, for maybe the two or three, uh, like, you know, like a, that um, organ that will be heavily, like, a, a sequence, maybe, you know, this, this will be needed to be absolutely done, maybe even to store later for even making IPSC to even after be able to do like organoids and any other like uh, kind of, uh, it's, a, it's a good point, yeah. Thank you. So we had a very interesting uh, discussion about the pancreas. Uh, the pancreas is a very unique tissue, show up in a moment. Uh, it's actually two tissues intermingled into one. There's an exocrine pancreas and an endocrine pancreas. The exocrine pancreas, shown here in this histology, uh, takes up about 99% of the volume. And the endocrine pancreas takes about 1% of the volume. But if you think about uh, human health, the end, this 1% endocrine pancreas is uh, responsible for disease. They're about a thousandfold more uh, uh, abundant than the exocrine disease. So, of course, we know there is uh, pancreatic tumors, but there's also diabetes. And so there is, that relates to the questions, the kind of questions that interest us about this organ that we maybe want to specifically enrich for this uh, 1% and could affect the, the approaches and the methods. So exocrine pancreas, the source of uh, enzymes that go into our digestive uh, system and break up biological material, uh, also the source of most of the RNAs in our body. This is uh, very good for our body, but very bad for uh, scientists handling uh, RNA. And this is something we need to think about in this tissue. Uh, the endocrine pancreas, uh, of course, very interesting. Uh, islets of Langerhans with, with four known cell types, beta cells, alpha cells, delta cells, epsilon cells, PP cells, and other unknown cell types. We discussed some heterogeneity of this structure, uh, heterogeneity relating to uh, spatial location, distance from the periphery of the islet. Uh, we discussed the subpopulations, potential subpopulations of these critical beta cells that secrete insulin that may be differ in their potential for proliferation, secretion sensitivity. Uh, we discussed the differences between mouse and human, making this human salatus really, really critical. The mouse islets are completely different than the human islet, and the mouse beta cells are in the core. Alpha cells are in the periphery, and the human, it's all convoluted. Um, so these are the endocrine uh, tissues. And then, then that relates to the particular uh, issues we discussed. So as I've told you, there's the RNA uh, 
quality problem. The pancreas is the source of uh, arenases. Uh, it's very tough to handle RNA. Um, there is critical uh, timing issue when we get uh, tissues from cadavers. We need to think about ischemia and uh, the damage uh, to cells. There were two uh, potential techniques that were discussed, for perhaps nuclear sequencing or single cell ataxy to get at the biological data uh, with these new approaches uh, that may be more robust to the RNA degradation that we see in these samples. Um, and in general, we think that this, uh, this tissue for this tissue particularly, it's very important to set up communication between the people involved in the project. Uh, so we discussed protocols.io, uh, which is a website for sharing protocols, uh, similar to GitHub, and uh, these protocols have a DOI, so they can be cited. And uh, we think it's very, very important that anyone dealing with uh, the pancreas would have access to as many um, protocols uh, as possible to avoid wasting time with these uh, issues that all of us are struggling with uh, regarding this tissue. Okay, so another uh, issue we discussed is uh, tissue sources. There's one option is cadavers. Um, we discussed the GTEx program, which also have a lot of uh, experience with these uh, problematic tissues. Uh, then there's some alternatives of biopsies from uh, pancreatic, uh, pancreatitis patients. Uh, these samples also have uh, interesting spatial um, sampling uh, uh, opportunities uh, going near inflammation or far away for, from the inflammation. Uh, and we also discussed uh, the individuals we would like to sample. So usually there's an age uh, axis that's very interesting. And we think that this in this particular uh, organ, actually the lean to obese axis could be very interesting. O obese individuals are uh, insulin resistant very often, and this causes the pancreas, especially the endocrine pancreas, to compensate. Uh, and this is, uh, this could be very, very interesting in terms of uh, the transcriptomic or proteomic changes to the organ. Uh, then there was a lot of uh, discussion about uh, the sampling issue that relates to this uh, disproportionate representation of this tissue in terms of uh, exocrine versus endocrine tissues. Um, do we want to just sample randomly, dissociate the tissue, perform single cell RNA sequencing? We're going to get 99% acinar tissues, 1% uh, endocrine, is this what we want, or do we want to specifically enrich via sorting or other uh, techniques uh, for the endocrine portion? Um, the suggestion was to go for broad skydive sampling, and then according to the results and also some computational analysis of the information content within each subcluster, we could decide uh, where, where to put the money uh, and where to go uh, deeper. And we also discussed how imaging modalities are critical uh, for the pancreas because this would naturally allow us to zoom in on this 1% uh, islets and their surrounding tissue and really explore the, the spatial axis. Uh, another really interesting feature of uh, the pancreas that's often ignored is its polyploidy, unlike, uh, unlike many tissues, but like other many tissues in our body, uh, the, this tissue is polyploid. Actually, many tissues in our body are polyploid, our heart, our liver, our muscles, as we're more like potatoes than we think. And uh, the acinar tissue is uh, mostly B-nucleated or one nucleus with 8N or even more copies. There's a vast diversity here. If we just, this is critical because if we think about uh, drop seek or other single cell methods, we want to make sure that they, we don't bias against these very large cells. We want to make sure we capture the complete diversity, uh, which is not, not completely trivial with existing techniques. So this is another thing uh, we discussed. Um, <laughs> Okay, and finally, uh, what I find very interesting is the uh, spatial information. So again, this, this tissue has interesting spatial information both within an islet and around the islets and between islets. So there's one very interesting uh, broad spatial axis, which is the head to tail uh, macroscopic axis within the pancreas. There could be uh, differences between exocrine and endocrine cells along this broad tissue scale. There could be differences between uh, exocrine tissue around islets and far away from the islets. Uh, within an islet, we know there is a center to periphery uh, axis of perfusion of the islets that can generate radiants. Um, so all of this is, is very interesting and it's very different also from other structured tissues like the liver and the intestine, which are just styled with stereotypical units. So here we have stereotypical, stereotypical units uh, which are the islets and their surrounding tissues, but they're embedded in 99% sort of uniform uh, mush. So this is something to think about. And again, 
uh, unlike spatial reconstruction based on single cell RNA sequencing and marker genes, we think that uh, approaches, multiplex imaging approaches like SecFish, Merfish, proteomic and multiplex approach approaches uh, would be important here in order to analyze spatial, spatial location, but to be able to zoom in on the rare regions in the tissue. And finally, uh, we discussed rare cell types, which again, uh, this is actually um, one of the reasons to go for a skydive approach. So there could be yonocytes, neuronal cells uh, of particular genotype, uh, genotypes, pericytes, endothelial cells that are very heterogeneous, resident immune cells. There are many cells in this tissue that we don't simply don't know about yet, and we could discover them. Uh, ductal cells could have different <coughs> subpopulations. And, um, and so, again, this is one, one reason to go deeply, to really sample tens of thousands of cells in order to identify these uh, potentially very interesting uh, subpopulations. Um, I think that's it. Yeah. I was just wondering, what is the approach to deal with RNases in pancreas? Yeah, so I guess this is the, the we heard the beautiful talk from the GTEx pro problem. Uh, there, again, th I think there are, there are protocols out there. Uh, many of us don't have access uh, to these. Um, yeah, I can, I can sort of tell you what, what we are doing in the lab, but I think that, like the, there's, there's common wisdom uh, out there, other than you know, handling fast and uh, working uh, low temperatures. So there's really detailed protocols, and that's why I think it's critical to have this, uh, this was an amazing idea to have this protocol IO mm -hmm. hub where we can really share these uh, tissue handling protocols. But is it just also like a ton of RNAs inhibitor or what? Just, I mean, quick, cold? Quick, cold, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, you know, you, you know, if you go, that's another reason why, why maybe we should think of a multiplexed uh, protein uh, imaging here, right? Because the proteins are, are okay, the problem is the RNA. Um, yeah. okay. Hi there, um, my name is Richard Harvey and uh, my co-discussant is um, uh, Eldad Tazor and uh, we're both uh, cardiac developmental biologists and stem cell biologists and uh, uh, in, in um, my preface, I've given uh, equal weight uh, to those issues, uh, along with uh, the adult heart and uh, uh, the diseased heart. So um, we didn't have a lot of cardiac, dedicated cardiac biologists uh, at, a, at our uh, session, but nonetheless, we had a, a, an interesting discussion. Um, so <clears throat> I just touched, uh, in the spirit of, of, uh, of, of going broad and top-down approach, I touched on a number of issues of, um, uh, of, of cardiac biology and uh, uh, as you know it's the, the, the cardiovascular system is the first organ system to function in development and evolution. It's really a highly modified uh, a muscular vessel. I think it's, uh, it could be classed as, as moderate or maybe unappreciated uh, complexity. There's good regeneration capacity in the neonatal period um, but uh, low cardiomyocyte proliferation and poor regeneration in the adult although this, uh, there's, there's some very uh, ardent work uh, surrounding uh, efforts to um, uh, stimulate regeneration uh, in this organ. Uh, cardiac stem cells exist, but they're, poor, they're rare and they're poorly uh, characterised, and their contribution to, to adult heart rate repair is controversial. <coughs> Certainly stromal cells are, are critical to, to homeostasis and uh, uh, their... Um, uh, uh, associated with, with disease through their roles in inflammation and fibrosis and uh, uh, arrhythmogenesis and uh, uh, they're very subtle in their biology and, and, and are both facilitators and uh, barriers to regeneration. I think it's very important uh, to understand uh, this axis and their relationship to, to immune cells. Coronary artery disease and heart failure are in epidemic proportions and, and um, <clears throat> just to touch a bit further on the burden of disease. Uh, Australia has a population of 25 million, about 45,000 deaths from cardiovascular disease every year, one every 12 minutes. It's, it's the most expensive disease group. One in five are affected with cardiovascular disease. One in three will die from it. 
and given the same risk factors, uh, women are three times more uh, likely to die of cardiovascular disease than men uh, 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 by the age of 80. Um, <clears throat> the main disease types are coronary artery disease, uh, stroke, uh, cardiomyopathy and heart failure, heart failure, coronary artery uh, disease and heart failure are in epidemic proportions and ri rising in the developing world and the risk factors of pervasive family history, hypertension, uh, blood uh, cholesterol levels, smoking, diabetes, being overweight and obese and lack of exercise. So, so I felt it was important to, in, in approaching uh, this exercise to um, understand uh, to understand disease, we need to understand the template for disease, the triggers of disease, the remodeling process, the adaptation of the organ to, to injury, uh, uh, any regenerative drive that exists, and of course uh, the responses to drugs. And I, and I think this is a very important sort of conceptual framework to, to consider uh, as we go forward. <clears throat> so I touched on, on uh, heart development, uh, one of our favorite issues, of course, uh, the uh, deposition of heart progenitor fields. Um, how they uh, form a template heart tube, how that grows through the addition of stem cells, uh, progenitor cells to the, both the inflow and outflow poles. There's a very uh, simple uh, 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 vessel at this point. Uh, chambers come into being uh, as simple, um, specialised domains through un un misunderstood, not misunderstood, but poorly understood processes. They grow, however, and, and take, uh, dominate the mass uh, of the heart whilst the original template is minimalised and uh, <coughs> it has ongoing and very important functions. For example, the, the um, induction of, of valvular tissue. Uh, touched on uh, complexity of developmental processes, for example, this uh, beautiful sponge-like nature of the cardiomyocytes that form uh, in the chambers during development and are very central both to development and to evolution and to um, uh, adult uh, pediatric and adult uh, disease. Um, uh, and uh, we spent some time talking about uh, the human ES and iPS cell, so efforts and, and disease modelling, uh, as, as in other systems, uh, we have methods now based on uh, cytokine, opposing cytokine gradients or small molecules to differentiate uh, <laughs> these cells into uh, cardiomyocytes. The system has its uh, limitations um, <coughs> uh, because these cardiomyocytes uh, are generally uh, very immature and uh, corresponding, I believe, uh, without um, uh, further uh, efforts to mature them uh, to first trimester um, uh, 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 individuals. But nonetheless, um, because we can tweak the gradients that um, <coughs> uh, are present and interact uh, at gastrulation, uh, we can direct differentiation to different mesodermal and cardiac and vascular and blood progenitors uh, to atrial and ventricular cardiomyocytes, albeit immature, pacemaker tissue to epicardium even and epicardial derived uh, uh, fibroblasts and uh, probably to a cardiac type of endo endothelium and smooth muscle and uh, with various uh, um, um, uh, bioengineered uh, platforms and working uh, models we can uh, uh, advance maturity uh, to, to, to cardiomyocytes, at least some cardiomyocytes will advance T-tubules which is a, a good benchmark um, uh, to um, uh, we can make organoids that, where we build in fibroblasts and vascular tissue uh, that are capable of uh, reaching post-mitotic stages and, and regenerating after injury. Drugs can be found to alter these processes and uh, uh, we now have very sophisticated uh, uh, phenotyping tools, uh, principally around uh, uh, electrophysiology. So the so postnatal heart is, uh, <coughs> um, uh, as I mentioned, um, capable of regeneration uh, in, in mice and probably humans. Uh, there's massive growth uh, after birth. Um, cardiomyocytes occupy only about 30% of the number of cells. The growth um, is largely due to uh, some uh, proliferative capacity immediately postnatally in the first week and also a spike in adolescence, but the majority of growth is uh, through uh, hypertrophic growth. And um, uh, also at this stage, you get an increase in, in binucleation in, in mouse and polyploidization uh, in humans. And uh, the cessation of, of proliferative ability here is, is the subject of great interest uh, uh, because of the regenerative uh, um, <coughs> drive towards uh, regenerative biology. And it's often thought that that rapid transition between a glycolytic and a uh, oxidative state creates oxidative stress, DNA damage, and contributes to the um, uh, deep quiescence that these cells enter. So we, we talked about that. 
uh, a regeneration in the neonatal period, um, which is near complete if done at day one, fails if done at day uh, seven after the proliferative period, partial at day um, 15 after this little spike of proliferation in adolescence. And interestingly, there's human uh, case reports suggesting full regeneration in neonates um, or, uh, or children, uh, but these are just uh, a, a limited case studies. So touched on those uh, issues. And I became a little bit obsessed, I think, in preparing this uh, with the methods for um, preparation of tissue, um, uh, including fetal tissue, uh, hoping to uh, maximise our chances of, of discovering new biology. And one of the things I, I introduced was this uh, emerging concept uh, of, uh, in clinical practice in cardiac transplantation medicine, <coughs> and it's where they um, uh, are trying to advance the use of uh, DCD hearts. And this is donation after circulatory death. And what happens is a patient uh, suffers a trauma, they're put on uh, life support, and then at an appropriate moment that's withdrawn, and after a, 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 a legally uh, defined uh, standoff period, which uh, varies in different countries, the organ is harvested uh, or, or even resuscitated uh, in the uh, dead individual, uh, and uh, it can be perfused with uh, blood or synthetic uh, blood for, for extended periods of time, many hours, allowing, allowing the hearts to be transported across the nation uh, the size of Australia, and, uh, and uh, the, the heart is recovering from its warm ischemic time uh, during this period with the help uh, of post-conditioning agents. And, and I, I thought this would be a very good uh, template for getting the best possible, uh, highest possible quality uh, from post-mortem uh, samples. Uh, occasionally the hearts that, that, that are normally destined for transplantation are not used, for, for often for not particularly severe re reasons. And uh, these uh, would give us um, an opportunity to sample uh, different tissues <coughs> according to our pr priorities um, uh, in, in, I think, the most uh, pristine uh, form that we could possibly achieve them, uh, possibly achieve. And uh, so we, we talked a little bit about whether this, in fact, was overkill or whether a Rosetta Stone um, um, approach would, would be uh, meritorious uh, for this initiative. And so uh, through these train of thoughts, I came up with a number of or summaries or discussion points <coughs> that, as I said, gave equal access, equal weight to a development and regeneration. Um, access to early stages of heart formation, looping, chamber valve formation, all very important, I think, for the understanding of congenital disease and adult uh, uh, onset disease is limited by the limited availability of early fetuses. Uh, whole heart analysis of early uh, uh, available stages uh, would be a priority, I believe. Uh, followed by available uh, later time points. And it seems to me there's no sort of coordinated activity around uh, um, access to precious uh, fetal tissue. Uh, the brain uh, people might be doing it differently to the heart people in some sort of centralisation, some degree of centralisation and coordination that uh, um, benefits from uh, the established logistical and ethical pipelines and concentration of uh, anatomical expertise that would normally uh, be on site. <coughs> So uh, whilst the access to neonatal and adolescent stages might be more delicate uh, in terms of uh, family uh, issues, um, the, the profiling of cells um, from these uh, stages is also highly desirable uh, uh, f with respect to congenital heart disease causation and adaptation, understanding the patterns of cardiomyocyte proliferation or cessation of proliferation postnatally and uh, uh, to, to understand heart regeneration in permissive and non-permissive phases. So despite the challenges of, of harvesting uh, this tissue under traumatic circumstances, it would be desirable to, to uh, uh, set up pipelines uh, where this was possible um, with the appropriate clinical uh, guidance. So we talked a lot about the iPS cell uh, technology. It's developing rapidly, so we need frameworks that, that can uh, answer um, uh, current and future questions. Um, we need the discussion around the cell lines that we, cho we chose, and we had some discussion around this, uh, which lines, uh, what degree of characterization, uh, uh, what uh, number, what diversity, uh, what tissues we will differentiate them into uh, of many different methods, uh, and how best to link to bulk or single cell genomic and epigenomic data and, func and the functional genomics push. Um, cell type identification uh, in these uh, systems may be a little bit uncertain, but certainly aided by cross-thread for reference to this growing atlas. And I think the biggest opportunity here uh, is not so much in the more mature cells, 
uh, except for obvious uh, reasons they, they can be used for, for drug screening and uh, uh, functional genomics. But with respect to this atlas, to do a skydive into those very early stages of cardiovascular lineage specification uh, with the benefits of scale and, uh, uh, and um, uh, targeted manipulations. And finally, <coughs> with respect to adult, adult tissues, um, trying to balance new knowledge generation with preconceived ideas about cells and, and disease processes, uh, which have in the heart have been characterised very well, in fact, with respect to cardiomyocytes at least. The needs of uh, emerging disciplines uh, such as uh, cardiac bioengineering uh, are present, uh, unknown. Uh, I, I mentioned the Rosetta Stone approach is this overkill, uh, a possible use of the perfusion hearts. Uh, the yield would be low, but the quality, I think, would be very high. Um, this uh, uh, template for understanding disease uh, needs to be kept in mind. Um, uh, we could sample, I think it's important to sample cardiomyocytes from different areas of the ventricle and, and uh, ventricles and, and harvest them from both atria if logistically possible. And for example, left and right atria and defined regions of, of the ventricles, apical, mid, basal, sub epicardial, mid, sub endocardial would be an appropriate uh, um, compromise. Coronary arteries, obviously very important. It can be, uh, the main arteries can be sected along with strips of myocardium, uh, but potentially the aorta, carotid arteries, and, and perhaps region, regional uh, um, variations on those may need to be uh, harvested as well to, to understand uh, the um, atherosclerotic drive uh, in a particular individual. Um, the diversity in stromal and immune elements, obviously very important. Uh, we anticipate, as an important one, heart-specific issue, we anticipate very heavy losses of interstitial, immune and vascular cells when we're trying to make cardiac uh, preparations and we discussed that uh, a little bit and uh, valvular tissue also is important. So we tried to identify finally um, some cardiac specific issues and maybe uh, Eldad can take up uh, some uh, a summary of what we discussed. All right, so uh, Richard did a wonderful job. So I, I just take one second to one minute, maybe. Uh, first of all, it was really impressive two days uh, um, hearing about this HCA uh, uh, project. So I want to congratul congratulate uh, the team that uh, made it. And uh, the other thing that was sort of emerged here, everyone is saying that uh, his tissue of uh, Favorite is the most important one. It's clearly the heart, right? So there is no doubt about that. Um, the other thing I was struck is that basically in each team, almost in each uh, um, organ, we, we had the same problem. The complexity of the tissue, the, the, how to dissociate tissue, and particularly in the heart, I mean, this is a major issue to obtain adult cardiomyocyte. You saw uh, from Richard's uh, presentation the size of the cells. You cannot sort the cells. So it's a major uh, um, issue of dissociation, enzymatic uh, uh, um, reaction, and digest, and, and everything else, which we will have to share protocol for that, uh, for sure. Of course, the ischemic um, environment, how much this is affecting, I guess, any tissue, the brain, the heart, probably the same, we might actually, uh, and we also discussed this, that we can um, adopt some of the techniques that are already uh, available for, um, for the brain, or uh, again, using uh, uh, post-mortem tissues. Um, again, uh, the other tissue that came all the time, the ploidity of the cells, binucleation is a major issue in, in the mouse, or polyploidity in human tissue. Um, um, of course, the extensive ECM and 3D structure complexity that exists. Um, and I think basically Richard already uh, covered all the points uh, which were discussed. Thank you. <laughs> Is there any question? Oh, yeah, that's me. Yes. I'm Evan McCosco, and my partner in crime was uh, Mario Suva. 
We led a very interesting and stimulating discussion about how we're going to tackle uh, the uh, human nervous system. Um, and since we're pretty short on time, I just wanted to kind of emphasize the particular challenges and excitements associated with uh, the brain. So, is this one? Okay. Um, so, uh, we, we just took this uh, definition from the white paper of what an atlas of the brain should include, which should be some sort of uh, definition of diverse molecular profiles that also integrate anatomical properties, connectivity, and also functional properties, a pretty challenging um, uh, premise. And the thing that we wanted to emphasize particularly is a key consideration in the nervous system, perhaps even more so than in other uh, tissues, is the incredible anatomic complexity. You know, in other tissues, there may be a replicating unit that occurs, you know, maybe four or five replicating units. We're talking about dramatic amounts of complexity at a macroscopic level. So these are uh, sort of different sections that give you a, a sort of a very broad framework of, you know, sort of forebrain complexity and then midbrain, hindbrain complexity and also the complexity of the, uh, the spinal cord. So we're really wanting to consider all of these aspects of the CNS. But then if you just look at one section through, you know, one particular region um, or one particular set coronal section of a human being, you find uh, just uh, 32 annotated macro st structures that exist. So um, these are, uh, this is just an incredibly complex tissue and there's very little like anatomical relationships between all of these different tissues and many of them are um, uh, incredibly, incredibly small and fine. So in addition to this sort of key consideration of anatomical complexity, which we really emphasize in our discussion, there's also uh, the, the, the issue of inaccessibility in vivo, the inability to perturb or um, uh, really derive any functional understanding of the, t of the actual tissue that will be uh, profiling post-mortem. Um, we have poorly defined functional units, so it's not as if we, we many of these you know, uh, regions are very densely connected, so uh, there's lots of different ways that we can define units and they aren't necessarily spatially constrained. Um, and also, this is also an issue in other tissues, but it's particularly uh, uh, dramatic, I think, in, um, in the brain. There are certain tissues that have 99% one cell type, and then the other 1% are incredibly complex, and there are others that are highly distributed across many cell types. Um, and we particularly in the brain, I think, need much more, uh, you know, uh, fidelitous models uh, than we have right now. Uh, we can't primarily, we can't do primary cultures of most reasons. Um, and uh, again, this is just the same issue of, of inaccessibility and poor anatomical um, uh, functional, uh, 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 functional unit definitions. So when we're thinking about the goals for the atlas, these are some of the things we discussed. We really are thinking about, um, and this really derives from Donna's question about like what, what are the, in the last session about like what are the actual goals that we want to, want to attain for this for, you know, atlas 1.0. Um, we want to, you know, sort of transcriptionally and spatially define as much as we can the key cell types in individual tissues. Um, and then hopefully the uh, process of doing that will pinpoint regions of opportunity for the next phase. Um, so what are the particular, you know, anatomical subunits we want to focus on further? Um, and are there ways that we can, I just put this in from the conversation, are there ways that we can kind of predict which particular structures are going to yield even more complexity um, so we can really focus our efforts better? Um, and furthermore, can we, uh, you know, kind of use our information to generate and inform better, better models? Um, so fortunately, when we think about our approach, so I would just kind of take this also from the, from the white paper. Um, uh, fortunately, actually, in many uh, particular detailed ways, we're, we're quite constrained. But um, this is sort of the overall uh, approach that I think many are taking to have this sort of one arm of uh, kind of a more unbiased, um, high-scale uh, sampling by, for example, sequencing approaches, and then also to have, in addition, dovetailing it, um, a, a spatial uh, arm. So why are we particularly constrained uh, in our approach in the atlas? Um, I think particularly because of this um, uh, immense uh, com tissue complexity and cellular complexity, um, we really have resigned ourselves uh, to sampling a smaller number of people to obtain a larger uh, sen a sense of the broader sort of anatomical complexity. Um,